Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Professor Dame Carol Black, uh, who I said before is going to be discussing her independent review of drugs, uh, and we'll have a Q&A uh, afterwards. Uh, please, again, if you've got any questions, put them in the chat, and we'll pick those up during the Q&A session. Um, so uh, just to give a little bit of a background uh, about uh, Dame Carol, so uh, she chairs the NHS England Improvements Advisory Board on Employee Health and Wellbeing. Uh, she's an advisor to the NHS Improvement and Public Health England on health and work. Um, she's previously conducted reviews on issues such as sickness, absence and employment outcomes related to addiction and obesity. Uh, she's also uh, chair of the Centre for Ageing Better and chairs the board of Think Ahead, uh, which is the government's fast stream training programme for mental health uh, social workers. She's a chair of the British Library. She's also a former president of the Royal College of Physicians and former principal of Newnham College, Cambridge. Uh, so we're very pleased that you could make time to be here, uh, given all the various other things she, she's doing. Um, so if I can uh, hand over to you, uh, Dave Carroll, if you'd like to maybe speak 15, 20 minutes and then we'll do a, a Q&A. Kevin, thank you very much indeed. And thank you for inviting me to talk about uh, the independent review. As you know, it's in two parts. Uh, it seemed a very long journey to me. I was asked to do this oh, in December 2018. We started the work in 2019. Part one um, published in February 2020. Part two now finished, and I hope very much is going to be published at the beginning of July. It's in number 10, just waiting for a slot um, on the grid. Um, I cannot, of course, give you the recommendations from part two, but I am going to address the areas on which we focused in the report and where you can expect and we'll see recommendations. Of course, I am not um, an expert. I'm not a psychiatrist. I, I'm an independent person. I've tried to take a very independent evidence-based view to this uh, problem. Um, it is a really difficult problem in both of these parts. Uh, I could not address anything that required a change in legislation, so I have not done that. Um, but I have tried very hard to address supply and demand, treatment and recovery, and, and something um, on prevention. Um, so drug dependency, as you all know better than I, is a very complex, stigmatized problem. And one of the things I've realized over these two years of doing this work, that uh, drug dependency is not owned by any one department. Uh, it, it's really frustrating. You need six departments of state if you're really going to make any progress at the center. I suppose it's been too complex, probably too difficult, indeed too messy. And of course, the, the end result of all this is it creates personal family and social misery. And as you will have seen in part one, um, costs the government some 19 billion pounds a year. I'm going to go back, if you don't mind, to part one, because so much of what we said then has informed what we've done in part two. And uh, as you know, part one addressed supply and demand for illicit drugs. Um, there were many months of really rigorous analysis to try and understand the very complex and overlapping markets for illegal drugs. I took a market approach. It hadn't been taken before, um, but I did it because the supply um, of drugs is driven by profit and violence is often the result of uh, competition for market share. And I felt only by understanding the market and, and the drivers behind that market could government hope to disrupt it. Uh, for example, and you will know uh, this only too well, the growth in the county lines appears to be largely caused by market saturation in the big cities. It has exploited vulnerable people, especially the young. At the time when I did part one, some 27,000 young people um, in London identified as uh, gang members. Not all, but many were drawn into a drug dealing with deadly consequences. Um, and the supply and distribution of drugs have become increasingly violent. 
but you know as well as I that there's a very tragic human story behind this market analysis. Drug deaths in, 19, in 2018, when I started the review, were the highest on record. Since 2012, heroin-related deaths have more than doubled, whilst deaths involving cocaine have increased fivefold. We have the highest number of rough sleepers dying on our streets from drug poisoning since records began. That wherever I looked, the statistics, the findings were worse. Long-term drug users cycle in and out of our prisons. And I met many of those people. I was able to visit prisons in part one, but of course not in part two. Um, and many of them uh, do not achieve recovery. And most of them do not have the opportunity to find meaningful work. Many of their children are taken into care and problem drug use is highly correlated with poverty. And these problems blight our most deprived communities. It looked like that in part one and it was absolutely confirmed in part two. So in part one, I did see firsthand in prisons, schools, youth clubs and charities the effect of increasing supply, greater drug purity and easier availability. Um, that had combined uh, with cuts in the police force, the border control force, the national crime agency, cuts to schools and local authorities, and the protective factors that have kept children and young people and at-risk families out of danger uh, disappeared. And in part one, I called that the perfect storm. Increase of any drug you wanted to buy, very easy ways of buying it, the development of county lines, and then austerity. And I noted in part one, but of course in part two, I've looked at it in much greater detail, that the treatment services have been curtailed by cuts in local government funding. Um, the total cost to society of illegal drugs, as I've said, is, is some over 19 billion a year. But until this last year, only 600 million or just above that was spent on treatment and prevention. So a huge amount of, um, of unmet, uh, unmet need out there and, and that it was easy um, to, uh, to record. Um, treatment services were getting worse and worse. Some had disappeared and the treatment workforce was declining in number and quality. And I said then, and it confirmed in part two, we needed to transform our approach to treatment, investing in it, but also innovating so that treatment services can respond to today's drug market and future uh, developments. I felt and felt even more so in part two, the government had deprioritized these problems. Um, from drugs entering the country right through to helping drug users access appropriate treatment and achieve recovery. And I very much hoped, and I think it did that part one of the review laid many of the problems bare to the government. And I think provided a firm platform for decisive action uh, by um, the government. Now in part two, what I've tried to do is set out a way forward on drug treatment and recovery. Um, the drug market, as you know, is driving many of the nation's crimes, half of all homicides and half of acquisitive crime are linked to drugs. And people with serious drug addiction occupy one third of our places in prison. And entrenched drug use and premature death occur disproportionately in our deprived areas, especially in the north of the country. And I believe that the pandemic has widened these inequalities. And if we go into recession, that of course will make it worse. Um, so I think everything I described in part one has probably got worse uh, rather than better. So the main findings, and none of these will be a surprise to you in part two, were that funding cuts had left treatment and recovery services on their knees, um, and in some parts of the country, it's distressingly so. Commissioning has been fragmented 
and I found little accountability for outcomes and partnerships, which hitherto had been strong between local authorities, health and criminal justice agencies had deteriorated. And all I really could see was a lot of fragmented, not really very good services starved of, uh, of resources. I found the workforce to be demoralized and depleted, and there were falling numbers of professionally um, qualified people. And those who were professional by lived experience certainly did not get the recognition they deserved. Very often they were volunteering and not uh, treated as we would normally treat people uh, with, with professional expertise. Our inpatient detoxification, res residential rehab, specialist services for young people, treatment for cannabis and service and stimulant users all had been um, cut back. And I really felt that ministers and departments had not worked together in a joined up way. Government finds it difficult to do joined up working. And because of that, although there have been lots of small initiatives, all intending to do well, they weren't done in a determined and a sustained way. And I've said quite clearly in the review that this is intolerable and we need changes in four areas. So we of course need radical reform of funding. Um, the funding of drug uh, treatment had not received any input to funding until this year when it got 80 million. We need a radical reform to commissioning and leadership. We basically have to rebuild services and develop integrated systems of care and support. And we of course need increased focus on prevention and early intervention. I was really surprised, I didn't expect to find so little research and science that could inform policy making, commissioning and practice. This is not true in countries like the USA, Australia and Canada, when they have invested in research and, and the science uh, behind drug addiction. And they were able therefore to do more controlled trials to, to really work on that um, research um, agenda. So it's, it's those four areas that I've concentrated on um, in the review, and it will come as a surprise, I suspect, to many people that I do not see treatment and recovery as just that which you can do um, either through medical intervention, psychosocial intervention. I see recovery and, and the proper treatment of people with drug dependency extending into proper treatment of their comorbidities, of their mental health, and trauma that many of them have received that has to just be an integrated part of care, not an add-on. I see safe housing and I see the ability to find a job if you are at that stage and that is what you want, something purposeful to do. For me, come within the treatment envelope. What we've done year on year in the past, we somehow have thought that if we get better treatment of the medical and biopsychosocial variety, and we do some sort of recovery, then we're home and dry. And you'll see in the review that I absolutely disagree with that. This is different from other conditions. It requires a whole system approach. It requires six departments of state to come together and really give it the priority it needs. And if we don't get that, it's almost impossible um, to do this. So I said very clearly that government must strengthen its national leadership of work to, struggle, to tackle drug misuse and departments need to be held to account. This is essential as is increased funding available to provide an effective treatment and recovery system for people with drug dependency. I'm not foolish enough to think that the treasury are going to do that all in one year. They have, over the past few months, demanded from us an absolutely endless stream of, of, of um, information about will this be 
money well invested? Will there be a return on, on investment? Um, we've done everything we can to assure the Treasury uh, with suitable uh, information and data that it would be money well spent. It would lead to less crime, less homicide, a safer society, and a much better outcome for the individuals that are drug dependent and their family, and it would, of course, drive um, uh, prevention. I've stated quite clearly in the review that this can't be money that is just put into a general pot, because if you put money into a general pot, it usually doesn't get to drugs. It doesn't get to the area that most needs it. I know ring fencing isn't popular, but I believe if you want to serve this particular problem well, then the money has to go to drug dependency. Um, and, uh, uh, and that I've stated quite clearly. I've also addressed the problem of accountability. Uh, we do need accountable systems. We need to know that if we do manage to get further investment, that we can show a return on that investment. Some things were very difficult. Um, and, and one of them, as you will well know, is how do you secure local delivery of a coordinated package that encompasses all those elements I've just uh, mentioned to you? They don't sit neatly. They don't sit neatly within the NHS. They don't sit neatly within local authorities. Um, it, it, it is really very difficult. There's no one place where you can just go to and say, I'd like all of these five things, please, because that's what the person needs. Um, you absolutely have to um, engender a system in which there will be um, both accountability and collaboration. Um, and I really have asked for accountability for high quality coordinated delivery. Um, in a system that acknowledges drug dependency to be a chronic condition, I believe that drug dependency is a health condition. Although as I've indicated, you need a lot more than health intervention to improve where we are, um, but it needs to be treated just like you would treat somebody with diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis. They need to have parity with other chronic conditions because it is a chronic condition. It is a condition that will have relapses. It, 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 not everybody will relapse, but many will. And we have to put that into the equation and be sure that we have the same services and give the same attention to that as we would to anyone with a chronic condition. And the connection between the national um, accountability and what is happening nationally and the local needs to be very strong. Um, we also need to ensure that the comorbidities, by that I mean the liver disease, the respiratory disease, the infectious disease, which so many of our heroin and crack users have, are dealt with in a timely and appropriate manner. That simply doesn't happen today. And in the review, you will see we pay particular attention to mental health and the need for a trauma-informed service. Obviously, treatment groups uh, need to be prioritized by need. As you know, there's an evidence base for heroin and crack users, although it, it absolutely um, needs improvement, although the service is evidence-based. Um, the last few years have seen it deteriorate. But we don't have the same service for non-opiate users. And uh, we need to employ more professionally qualified people, particularly to deliver psychosocial interventions um, and uh, to improve the clinical service. And we really need to expand the service we offer to those who are newer service users. And that would be the very best time to help someone. Um, there are many of those who think this service is not for them and that there's nothing um, available. And I've also spent quite a bit of time in the review talking about communities of recovery um, because they need to be part of every drug treatment uh, system and that needs to be country-wise. There are parts of our country where that is done well 
and parts where it's not. And I mentioned earlier the crucial role that professionals by lived experience uh, play in this. Um, once, if you like, the medics and the clinically qualified people have done their job, you can't complete this journey without you have peer workers to support you. I spent quite a lot of time with DWP and MHCLG because safe housing is crucial and the potential for work or, or something purposeful to do um, is essential. And uh, we do have to help us there. The results of the recent uh, take, taken part of the last three years, the individual placement support trials um, for individuals with drug dependency who are in treatment. And those, uh, and those trials have uh, shown good results and it shows that you can support people um, to do that. Then a considerable part of the review is on the criminal justice system. So we've looked at criminal justice settings and offered a way of enabling diversion of drug users into treatment rather than the rather useless time many of them spend um, in prison just for a few months where if anything, it makes it worse, uh, not better. And also there's a part of the review that concentrates on the prisoners leaving prison and to make sure that the services that are available to them are much, much better than they are now. Currently only one third of such prisoners are in treatment within three weeks of release. And that's a very vulnerable time. Um, I'm very conscious of the need for prevention and early intervention. I didn't do as much on that as I would have liked. It's a huge topic in its own right. Um, but I have endeavoured to make some useful suggestions working closely with the Department of Education. And then, as I said, um, I really do want to improve what is there in research um, and science, because it's only then in our own country where we have that basis um, to really support um, policy making. So there's a lot to do this, and it's not a report that looks at any individual drug or any individual bit. It is a whole systems review um, report. It says quite clearly, and I do believe this, that drug dependency and its consequences have never been treated as a whole systems thing and never treated in a determined and coordinated way, often neglected and swept under the carpet. There are concrete proposals, which I think could be brought to fruition in this parliament. Um, and the wide range of actions proposed um, can bring together, if they're, if they're put into action, both central and local players. And I hope that there will be a step change and that this time things can be different for that part of the society, which I believe to date we've served rather poorly. Um, Mother can... Teresa many years ago said um, that she thought we would see that in this century that drug dependent individuals would, would be the modern lepers. And I feel that that is quite an accurate description of the treatment and support that many of them have found. So that gives you an idea. I'm sorry, I can't give you the precise um, recommendations, but as I say, it is, it is not a report that picks off any one treatment, that picks off any one thing. It, it is about a whole systems change. It is about building up a, a better workforce. It is about the centre doing things differently, and it is about what's happening at the local commissioning level. So thank you very much, Kevin. Thanks very much, uh, Dan Carol. Uh, George has cut up uh, quite a fitting and helpful conclusion there. So um, it's opportunity for people to uh, ask questions. Um, so if you have any questions, the two ways of doing it, um, either put the question in the chat or just um, use the raise your hands button on the uh, on your Zoom screen. And, uh, ah, okay, we have a question here from, I think it's Danny, Danny Ahmed. Um, Jamie, can we unmute Danny so Danny can ask his question?
Yeah, hi. Um, I, I'd just be um, really interested in and Dan Carroll's thoughts on the role of um, heroin assisted treatment. So I'm involved in Middlesbrough scheme, which has seen some really good results and mm. um, that have been independently evaluated. But we're facing uh, funding issues almost immediately. Um, so I wondered if she saw a role for heroin assisted treatment and um, any avenue for funding really for the continuation of such services and for the widespread access to this treatment option. Thank you. Uh, thank you. As I said, I haven't looked at any individual treatments in detail. I haven't tried to assess the value or otherwise. What I've tried to do in this review is to make the case for increased funding that would be available for those who then commission the services, to commission services that for their local populations they think are necessary and that they would then make the choices. It is not for me, I don't think, to tell anyone which of the available treatments, if they are available and how they want to sort of use the resources they have. What I do think it's reasonable for me to say is what I expect to service to deliver in terms of outcomes and output for those who are drug dependent. So I'm sorry to disappoint you. It, it is not an area I don't know well, the international literature on this topic, or indeed, I'm, I must say the literature uh, in depth um, in this country. So I, I'm sorry about that. Okay. Um... Thanks for that question, Danny. I've just got a question here, I think from Meg Jones. So perhaps if um, you can unmute Meg. Uh, Meg, over to you. Yeah, um, really interesting. Thank you um, for that uh, keynote. Um, and it was just picking up on your reference to, I think the complexity of, of this issue sitting across many different departments in, in government. Um, and just to hear your thoughts really on um, the potential for local devolution. So obviously I work for the West Midlands Police and Crime Commissioner and, and the work we've been able to do locally here, um, but also any potential for pool treatment budgets or commissioning bodies to join up approaches to funding, um, but also recognising that, that there is formula, forming, I think, a bit of a, a postcode lottery sometimes around opportunities for diversion in some areas that are not replicated in, in others. Um, so just your thoughts on that. Um, Thank you uh, very much, Meg. I mean, first of all, just to address this problem of, uh, of the centre. I mean, wh where we have got to is for the last several months, and it is quite a few months, we have had a group of uh, senior people and senior civil servants at the level of director general. So really quite senior from the departments uh, that we need around the table. So the Home Office, DWP, Department of Education, MHCLG, Health, uh, uh, DWP, a Ministry of Justice, I'm sure I've forgotten one there, coming together to work together um, to decide what is needed from each of them. And, and you'll see in the, in the review a recommendation that strengthens, if you like, that central bringing together because the aim would be that these departments who each have their own budget um, may or may not put drug dependency high on their list. And therefore one of my first jobs was to get them to see that it's not just health increasing its budget. Um, and then I think where, if, if, we, uh, if we manage to persuade the treasury um, that more money is available as, as what I hope for, but of course um, I won't be making the decisions, is that that money will be used wisely across the country um, in, in, into areas now, whether they will need um, to look at, at which are the worst areas at the moment. And if you like, think to, to, to perhaps put more resource there. I don't know, these decisions will not be mine, but I think my job was to try and make the case for the funding to prove that it would be money well invested. And then to say this can only be delivered locally. I am not um, 
silly enough to think that the center can deliver this. So what I want a, a strong local um, delivery mechanisms that hold people to account, but bring people together to work together. I mean, I was aware that there were and have been set up ADA centers and you'll probably know about the, the ADA project. And I presume when that sort of money is available, um, then, then areas of the country apply and decisions are made. Of course, I'm not part of that either. So there are occasionally, um, if you like, pockets of money that get given. I, I, I am not about pockets of money. I really want it to be a whole systems for everyone. And, and I've tried very hard to, to make that case because it, it isn't a, about just one bit or the country or the other. This is about fundamentally doing it differently and recognizing it as an, a problem that needs real attention. So I think that's that's where I'm, but I, I just want to assure you centrally, uh, we've been doing a lot of work already to try and lay the ground for much better central collaboration, uh, which I hope uh, will feed down into what we've recommended locally. Great, thanks. Uh, question Meg um, I'm moving on because we have some other questions I'd like to um, try and fit in as well so uh, over to Belinda um, Belinda Phipps um, if we can ah I can see Belinda but Jamie if you can perhaps mute Belinda that'd be great thank you There's such a lot of variation across the country between services and, uh, and you're talking about needing a whole treatment pathway approach whether there is a way for having some sort of central template um, commissioning approach a bit like is used with IAPT which is um, there's a central template and it's um, outcome based and performance paid type system um, Belinda, thank you. I can't actually go in. I wish I could to the recommendations in the review, but you will see that we have tried very hard um, to uh, to make some sensible recommendations in this area. I, I, I wish I could just give you more, but I can't. But I mean, we're very aware of what you've just said, and 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 there are some very good areas, and then there are some not so good areas, and we, and we need. We need to have outcome frameworks. We need we we need to get have some standards. We need to have accountability. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that question, Belinda. I'm going to move on to uh, Kevin Crowley. Um, Kevin, if we can, Jamie can find you and uh, Julie, unmute you. That'd be great. I'm definitely unmuted. Hopefully, you'll okay. see me as well. Uh, we can hear you definitely, Kevin. There you go. We're going to see you. Yeah. Great. Brilliant. I mean, I guess the question I really want to ask, and I know you can't answer, is about, you know, uh, the specifics of commissioning arrangements. Um, so instead of asking that question, I guess what I'm asking is, has the report taken into account the wider systems changes at the moment as a result of the ICS and healthcare services reconfiguring? And the fact that it's got that in the next nine months, if the parliamentary schedule is true, that that most of healthcare commissioning is also undergoing um, significant uh, reform, if you like. So, is so my, my elliptical question is: Has the report taken that into account? And and yeah, and if so, how so? Well, I can't, uh, as you say, rightly say, Kevin. Uh, to, to the best of our ability, uh, and to the state of knowledge that we have, we have a, we a have, of course, acknowledged the presence of of ICSs. But I have to make recommendations where I am at the moment. Um, with what might happen and how long it would take for that to happen. But it has been very much in our minds. Um, okay. Like quite a lot of things, you know, as we've done this report, of course, we've, we've seen Public Health England uh, split up. I mean, all kinds of things yeah. sort of happen around you. Um, so you somehow need to try and steer a line through it with a system that or with a reform and a change that, that could fit in um, to any system. I, I sort of hope that the ICSs might be a benefit. 
yes. um, that's what I'm hoping, rather than the opposite. I think that's right. And I, th I think it's when you uh, merge systems together, being aware of the totality of the effects, I think, and, and I'm, I'm heartened by your, your, your call uh, to wider systems. Yeah, it, 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 this is a whole systems thing. And, uh, um, Thank you. Okay, folks, thanks so much for that, uh, Kevin. So um, I've, I've been kind of uh, checking my timekeeping and uh, I, I think we've got time for one more question. So Carlos, yes, there are other questions there for Dame Carol. If perhaps Dame Carol could have a look at the chat and perhaps answer them uh, afterwards, uh, that'd be really helpful if possible. But I'm gonna go to a question from uh, uh, Peter Keeling. So apologies to the other people who, who might have questions there. Uh, Peter, could you could you unmute Peter Keeling and perhaps Peter could ask his question? Peter, over to you. Thanks, Kevin, and, and thank thank you, Dan Carl, for your for your presentation. Um, you know, a collective voice. I think we we just really appreciated the approach that you've taken with your independent review, and I think it's fair to say that uh, as a field, we're just sort of waiting with bated breath for the for the report. You can't um, be more frustrated than I am. I'm, I'm sure. Um, uh, my, my question was just, um, you know, really thinking about the anticipated government response. Um, obviously, the, the funding is crucial, um, but we, we, you know, we we won't get a, a commitment on that until the 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 spending review later in the year. But are you able to give any sense of, of what you think the, the government response might be when the report is actually published, as you said, hopefully in early July? Of course, I don't know. I, I, I anticipate as to many reports, it will be, um, I think they will definitely welcome it. Um, I think they're deeply, deeply um, committed actually into this area to do something about it. I don't doubt that at all. Um, I think that we have to make a very, very good case to the spending review. We tried um, to see whether the Treasury would be receptive to um, considering what's in the review before the spending review, but they've made it quite clear that it must go through the spending review, which is what you would expect them to say. Um, I am not expecting, nor in a way do I think it would be appropriate for the Treasury to suddenly say, well, you've asked me for five years of money or whatever, and you know, and here we are. I would like to see a real step change of commitment and that as long as we or, or those people delivering this service can show that, that investment in them is going to make a difference um, that the Treasury will do this journey with us. That's what I want to see, that that, that, that is um, the change. I have to say for what it's worth that, that I have never before known number 10 interested in this area and they are deeply interested. Um, and again, um, the Prime Minister has showed a real personal interest. Of course, there's still the Treasury to get through. Um, but I, I, I would be, um, I would be hopeful. It, it, it certainly, um, the, the government departments that we've worked with have given it um, their blessing, their backing. Um, of course, in, in the end, these things are political decisions, aren't they? And I will not be, I will not be making that. But I think they're at a point, as I've said in my forward, where. Um, well, it, it really is a point. They've either got to say they are going to take this seriously, they are going to do something about it, or, I mean, it, it really it is, a, it, I think it's at the point of breaking in some areas. I don't think that is too strong uh, a, a word. I think I've seen some services which are really on their knees. And so uh, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful, but I, you know, I'm very aware of everything uh, that surrounds it, but we have made the strongest possible evidence-based case uh, that we can um, to the right people. So live in, I think Peter will live in hope. <laughs> Great, thanks very much for that uh, question, Peter. Um, as I say, fortunately, um, we're kind of running out of time and, and um, want to make sure that we, have time for the expert panel which follows. So perhaps um, 
David Carroll, if you could, if you could perhaps, perhaps have a look at the questions in the chat okay. and if you could respond to them, that'd be really helpful. Uh, and just to say, thank you very much for- uh, Do I send the answers um, uh, to, to you, Kevin? I mean, because they're just names to me, aren't they? Um, Jamie, have you got any suggestions how best to do this? I mean, um, or we could send those, the chat well, to you, you often. Or could you, can you send, I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't, I'd be very happy to try and answer them. But I would like to be able to send them back to you know. Uh, yeah, I, I can go to the questions and send them on to you. Okay, Jim, and you can that would be that would be helpful, and then I'll do my very best. Okay, yeah. thank you very much, for it. and uh, Carol. I just uh, thank you for for joining us today and for giving us a, mm. a very enlightening talk. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so can I stay and listen? Yeah, of course, of course. Yes, please do. You're welcome. And ask questions too. <laughs> so, please, yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, I'm going to hand over to Amal, who, uh, Amal Ali, who's the policy officer from the Criminal Justice Alliance. Amal's going to uh, host and chair the, the, the expert panel session. Um, again, as before, um, we'll have a Q&A session. Um, so, put questions in the chat for the, for the expert panel members. Uh, and then, at the end of that session, uh, we're going to kind of hand over for probably a brief period at the end of the meeting to uh, our director, uh, CGA director, Anita Champion, just to give a director's report. Uh, but for now, I'll, I'm going to pass over to, to Amal. Over to you, Amal. Thanks, Kevin. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Amal Ali. I'm the policy officer at the CJA. And as Kevin said, it's my duty today to chair this next part of the session, which is the panel discussion. Um, it really is great to see so many familiar faces of both current and former colleagues. I say former in that I used to work for an organization that was dedicated to supporting and promoting the rights of people who use drugs and really shining a spotlight on the debilitating impact of our enforcement led approach to drugs. Um, that organization is RELEASE, which is the National Center for Expertise in Drugs and Drug Law. And I'm their former youth lead and associate researcher. And during my time there, I managed their youth-led stop and search project called Why Stop, which is a youth-led uh, national project that aims to equip young people with really practical tips and tools so that they can handle police interactions in a safe and confident manner. Um, often these interactions can be uh, frightening and humiliating and so we felt it was important to produce a project that would essentially reduce the potential for harm and as many of you in the call will be aware um, the vast majority of stop and searches both nationally and in London are for drugs. Um, so aside from that project work I'd also started to look at um, other police powers so for example more thorough and intimate searches and again um, to my recollection over 90% of those searches were for drugs and were disproportionate, um, disproportionately applied to black, Asian and ethnic minority groups. Um, I've also, um, sorry, I've also worked on other bits of work, um, uh, namely exploring equity, economic and social justice initiatives within cannabis reform. Um, that's enlarged from uh, assessing the work that's being done in North America and I guess that paper is essentially a roadmap for what a model of legalization would look like in the UK and it places emphasis on finding solutions that are both uh, centered on social but also racial justice and not just putting capitalistic interests at the forefront. Um, aside from sort of some of that work I've also done work on harm reduction namely uh, naloxone provision and so you could say that yeah, the topic of today's discussion is of some interest and I'm really looking forward to hearing from all of the speakers and yeah, as Kevin has said, so uh, each speaker will have 10 minutes to sort of uh, discuss key issues and then we'll open up to questions. So I'll kick this off by introducing the first speaker, which is Katrina French, uh, the director of Unjust CIC. Katrina read social and political sciences at Hughes Hall College, University of Cambridge. She was formerly CEO of national charity Stopwatch and chaired MOPAC's Pan London Stop and Search Community Monitoring Network. Katrina established London-based Unjust 
in January of this year, and the organization aims to reimagine policing, promote public safety and empower people. Uh, so Katrina, over to you. Thank you, Amal. Good afternoon, everyone. Just would like to begin by saying thank you to the CGA and Transform for putting on this really timely event. Um, as it's been said, it marks the 50th anniversary of the Misuse of Drugs Act. Um, I also would like to say a thank you to Dame Carol. It was really interesting to hear about drug harm and the lack of the, the system there to support. Um, what I'm choosing to discuss this afternoon is about law enforcement, specifically around the use of stop and search powers um, and how in an in a nutshell, the Misuse of Drugs Act has been mis misused, huh, no pun intended, for the last 50 years in a way that has really harmed black, black and brown communities across the country. Um, and I really want to speak about how we can highlight the problem, because I think in order to have solutions, we have to have an acknowledgement of the harm and the problem, but also look to the future. Um, so do a bit of a pause, rewind, and then a fast forward in 10 minutes. So um, seatbelts on. I'm really excited to share with you kind of my thoughts. So let's begin with where I see the problem lying is in fairness and proportionality and the lack of an evidence base in the current situation around drug policy. And when we're asked, is the Misuse of Drugs Act fit for purpose? Um, my, my instinctive action is to say no, and that's kind of from a human rights act, is that people have been using drugs illicitly or legally for many, many years, decades, eons, probably. And the approach that we have now, with all the knowledge that we have, seems to undermine people's human rights and actually penalise penalize them as opposed to support them either to desist from drugs or to have a better understanding around the drugs that they take. And I think it's really short-sighted and isn't doing anyone any good other than playing political football. So if we're gonna speak about solutions, we have to understand what's been going on so far. In my last role at Stopwatch, um, we oversaw the, a report called The Colour of Injustice, Race, Drugs and Law Enforcement. It was a, it was, um, a Mar was there at the time, um, a, a joint piece of work with, with Release and also the London School of Economics. And I think it was a defining piece of work in highlighting how drug law um, and despite the rhetoric of the time of knife crime being, you know, the push for stop and search and violence being the, the, the kind of craig of society we had to we had to get rid of, we looked at the statistics and found that year on year drug drug law enforcement was driving stop and search that was driving the racial disparity that we were seeing. It was also driving, in my opinion, the poor relationship between black and brown communities and policing. And I really want to reiterate that doesn't come down to those communities, although they're not homogenous, um, not liking the police. It comes down to their lived experience of police and powers being used in a disproportionate manner. So they're very valid concerns. They're very genuine concerns. And for far too long, they've, they've been ignored despite um, the statistical information saying that that, that that exists. So I do want to give some stats because it is the 35th anniversary of the Police and Criminal, Criminal Evidence Act. And that came in into, in 1986. And it was designed to ensure that there was proportionality and um, a higher threshold for police officers to carry out a stop and search. And I'm actually really saddened to say here we are 35 years later, 50 years after the Misuse of Drugs Act, and you still have officers saying the smell of cannabis alone can be used for a grounds of stop and search. The smell of cannabis. It's not as though you can just put it in a bottle and bring it to court and say, oh, this is what I smell on, you know, the high street. It feels very arbitrary. It feels very um, subjective and it doesn't feel very fair. And when we look at the statistics we see from the Home Office that in 2020, last year end in 2020 in March, there were 558,000 stops approximately. Of that, 350,000 approximately were for drugs. That equates 62%. So if you think about the time, the resources, and when I say drugs, we're not necessarily speaking about um, some of the more harmful drugs that um, Carol, um, Dame Carol Black was referring to in terms of opiates. A lot of this is low level drug possession for cannabis. We've been asking for many years now for police um, forces to give more granular detail about whether when they carry out a stop, it is for possession or whether it's um, for intent to supply, just so we have a better understanding of the drug market, whether police resources are being used proportionately and appropriately to obviously 
in a sense, stop drugs being used on the street. We haven't been able to ascertain that. But from speaking to people and in my former life as a chair of a stop and search panel in London, looking at the 5090 forms, the smell of cannabis is often used for, for, for grounds. So this isn't about, um, you know, hard drugs, you know, drugs that are causing addiction. And that isn't to say that there is not harmful use to cannabis. And that's more reason, to be honest, to advocate for, you know, decriminalizing it, decriminalization regulation. But it is to say that the that the story you're hearing isn't a once it isn't the, the a fair story it's one-sided and it's usually at the detriment of black and brown communities because unfortunately do we live in a racist society and it's very easy to pick us against one another and um highlight people as specific groups as having particular problems when actually they're societal problems and they require a whole systems approach. So in 2019, there were 223,000 stops um, for drugs. So we saw a big increase the following year of about 57%. And that's really worrying because out of all of those stops, um, all of the stops, the arrest rate was only 13% of that 558,000, but it was it was mainly for, for drugs. So mainly 34,000 drugs um, arrests. And I'm a strong believer that arresting people for drugs does nobody any good going into the criminal justice system. And that's why we have to have much more of an approach on prevention and intervention and diversion, but ultimately a stronger conversation around legalization and decriminalization that needs to be led by scientists, not politicians. And it's really unfair that if a scientist disagrees with a politician, they can be out of a job. We've seen that with Professor Nutt many years ago now, and it's a detriment. Sorry, my clock's about to chime. It's on the hour and then the half an hour, so I'll make sure I'm on mute in half an hour's time. Um, but it's very saddening when we get tied into political rhetoric because what that does is it doesn't do any, any anybody any good. And all that happens is communities suffer and we don't get the resources or the interventions that are needed. So um, enough of the statistics, on to some stories. Last year we saw a um, pandemic and during that time we saw the use of stop and search skyrocket to the highest it was in eight years. And that was because there was a, a misconception and a a rhetoric that every young black male out was out selling drugs. I think it's really pertinent to add in that, that rhetoric into this conversation because what we saw were young people out who were teachers, who were social workers, who were just going in and getting food for vulnerable people being associated as drug dealers because it, it the police couldn't fathom that they could just be doing anything other. So we saw laws that were being overused and abused. And we also saw some really key incidences of uses of force. So um, we had the tasering of a young man called Jordan Walker Brown in, in Haringey who ran because the week or two before he had been stopped and searched found with a small amount of cannabis. Um, he, he had paid a fine or something of the sort. He saw the police a couple of weeks ago and being a habitual cannabis user ran. Standing on a wall, the police tasered him. He fell off the wall. He's now at the moment paralyzed. And um, the police have said he won't walk again. Um, the hospital have said he won't walk again. We hope he will. That was because of a drug stop gone wrong. We saw the death of Rayshawn Charles, young man in Hackney a few years ago. It was a what was been dubbed a stop and swallow, where a police officer suspected he had drugs. He didn't have drugs. Um, nevertheless, he was wrestled to the ground. And um, unfortunately, he died as a consequence of that police and interaction. Um, the cop in 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 when they tested the the, the the substance, it was actually found to be caffeine and um, caffeine and paracetamol. It wasn't drugs. But what I'm trying to reiterate here is how drug law enforcement used in particular pockets of the country, because this isn't happening. I'll give the example of West Midlands, where at a time they were testing drugs for festival goers to make sure they were safe to use. I have no problem with that. I think it's a very measured approach. I do have a problem that you then have Notting Hill Carnival where people are smoking less lethal drugs um, for a shorter period of time and you have heavy handed policing and it being demonized as a black thing. Um, it, that's the issue for me, the racial injustice that is, is never spoken about the lack of a black voice or a brown face unless it's a perpetrator or um, it's, there's no space in this drug policy world for black or brown people to necessarily be victims or to, to necessarily receive the treatment because the narrative is so framed around drug law enforcement, drug um, gang crime, serious violence that it's there doesn't feel a space or a voice for, for black people to input into these spaces about their lived experience around the harms of over policing. 
I don't want to speak too much about stories, but I think they are important to speak to the stats because they do let you know that these aren't just numbers. They are people, um, people that are living in areas because they were born into those areas, maybe not all in poverty, but by definition are socially economically deprived and then we see over policing happening not necessarily because of them but because of misconceptions and perceptions but because of also drug policy that's that's failed you know ultimately people will continue to take drugs and what we need to do is adopt a more radical approach to assist in them so look into the future um there's a strong call for there to be re decriminalization of cannabis specifically um, and uh, a big push for things to be regulated. We know the country already produces cannabis. It's sold via GW, GW pharmaceuticals. So there's, to be frank, white men in suits making a lot of money out, out of cannabis. And you've got other people, working class white men as well, going off to prison. So this isn't just a racial divide. There's classism in here as well. And it's not based on, on evidence because if it was, we're very hypocritical to be selling something that we then are penalizing the country. And we're seeing a big, shift in the sea in terms of Canada, North America, South America cities, we've seen Portugal, we've obviously got long standing Amsterdam. Um, the conversation shouldn't be about, we need to be tougher on crime, on, on drug use. It needs to be about people have human rights to, to decide what they want to do. We need to have a 21st conversation around what are actual the social harms and how do we reduce those. We need to invest in mental health services. So if people do have adverse risk, um, um, effects to cannabis, there's support for that. But equally, we need to understand that this is um, a, a herb. It's been around once again for, for centuries. And there is a lot of evidence that has been suppressed or not been investigated in that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to collaborate with our partners across Europe and across the world to understand what's the best approach. Um, I'm very happy that Sadiq Khan has um, said he'll be doing this independent drugs commission I do suspect there may have been a bit of politicking in there because it was before an election but I'm hoping that members of the CGA and people that are in this arena will be calling and urging him to do what he said he would do and have that commission because I think it's um, an incredible opportunity for us to input um, I also think we need to look to places like Oakland where they have social equity models which have enabled communities that for years have been harmed by the over policing and this is they're particularly black communities, but I think, as I said, being the classist country that we are, this goes to working class white communities because I'm about social justice and inclusion is expungement of criminal records. And if the law does change, people that are still incarcerated for, for, um, for I'm speaking about class B, but cannabis offenses be released. And that actually that there's um, basically financial models for these people to enter the market because there is a market for this let's not deny it. people wouldn't be investing in the states if there was not a market it's not just about policy it's about ensuring that there's economical redress for people that are interested in pursuing cultivating or whatever branding in this area the, the world is your oyster that we support those and that we don't double down so that because they were too quick to come to market they're left out of that opportunity forever so I think those are the some of some of the ways that we could look to the future and ultimately is um there has to be less of a st stigma um around these conversations it needs to be really safe for people to speak about why they use certain substances um and how it's relieved I do understand that is double edged because if you're working in certain environments that's a threat to your job so I think there's a big role for the trade unions to play here I think there'll be a big role for local authorities in terms of licensings of cannabis and how it will be distributed um, and also PCCs and of course the, the police and others. But I have not mentioned the police in this because I don't think it should be a policing led approach. It's not to say I don't think they have um, a role to play in keeping social order and keeping people safe, but um, the harm from drugs for me um, comes from over policing. That's not just it, because it enters you into a system that often leads to far worse outcomes for you if you had not engaged necessarily within the police. Um, as And I say that just from, especially from a black perspective. So I really call on people to um, look at those stats from Stop and Search, to have an appreciation that it isn't what you think it is. Most of the stops are for drugs, low level drugs. Um, unfortunately, the police don't have the relationships with communities to know who are carrying weapons and knives to be able to increase the way they, they find the, those sorts of items. And we need to really understand what we're doing isn't evidence-based, it's not effective and it's harming communities. And we're all responsible for that. Um, I'll leave with the antidote of, um, if we don't do it now, we can't 
be upset if we're having this conversation in another 50 years time or maybe our children or grandchildren are and there's been much more social harm so as Dane Carroll said this requires strong leadership it requires a systemic approach and it requires it to be led by evidence paper evidence-based um, scientists, but also black, brown, working class communities that have for decades been over-policed and under-protected in the name of public safety. I'd really like to thank you for listening to me. And I'm looking forward to hearing from the rest of the panel and contributing to the questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Katrina, for that powerful contribution. Uh, really helpful. And again, just highlighting sort of the disproportionate impact of uh, drugs policing. Um, and as you say, there are a lot of conversations that are well intended, and it does feel like the critical mass is moving. Um, and we actually invited colleagues from MOPAC onto the call today, but they were busy, unfortunately. Um, so moving on, <laughs> moving on to our uh, next speaker, who is uh, Jason Q. Uh, Jason is a serving chief inspector with Thames Valley Violence Reduction Unit and works as a lead for drugs and harm reduction. Uh, Jason developed the Thames Valley Drug Diversion Scheme, which enables everyone found in control, sorry, everyone found with controlled drugs and assessment of their use and access to education and harm reduction without the need for arrest, interview, nor admission of guilt. The scheme has been a catalyst for health-based drug interventions across the UK and further afield, leading to policy changes within education to negate the need for uh, exclusions. So I'll hand over to Jason. Uh, thank you, Amal. Um, and thank you, Nina and James, for inviting me onto this panel today. And it's really humbling to, to be amongst all these experts, because I, I rarely, if ever, would ever refer to myself as an expert. Uh, and imposter syndrome is, is really crept in here because um, being uh, on a sim similar event with Dame Carroll is, is truly humbling. It really is a career highlight. So, um, but it's more than just a career because this is about real life. Um, and um, just, a, just a, a quick exclaimer about real life. Uh, I've got to collect my kids at three. Uh, so I'm literally sat outside their school next to busy main road. Uh, so I hope my colleagues don't come flying past. And if you hear loads of screaming, it's not a riot. It's definitely the school. So um, I'll, I'll give it my best. But um, thank you. But just to echo uh, many of the points already made by Dame Carol uh, and Katrina, um, what I'm going to say kind of threads uh, between uh, those two uh, those two talks because ultimately drug use is is complex. You know, I'm not an academic, and I'm not a a, 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 um, a uh, uh, an addiction specialist. Uh, I'm, I'm merely a copper with um, a few years under my belt. And but what I've seen through that is first-hand experience of police and drugs on the street, and and also getting to know those people who are most affected. And it's those real-life uh, stories, if you like, um, um, real-life events that have shaped what I'm about to say today. So this comes from a genuine heart uh, and a genuine need to uh, influence change where I can. Um, because we absolutely must reform our Drugs Act and uh, be much more health uh, focused. Drug use is complex. Um, uh, you know, drug use is, is throughout all socioeconomic groups. There's an academic phrase there that I picked up from someone, um, but it's true. Drug use is, is equal throughout society, but those communities who are over policed the most come to notice the most. Um, and uh, many people with problematic use or addiction have comorbidities. So therefore, policymaking should not stigmatise or judge. Yet it does. It absolutely does within the health system and within and within policing. It absolutely does. Stigma, of course, then as a result, can be much more harmful than the drugs themselves um, and increase the social harms of inequality and disproportionality. And an example of this in, within my own force is why, and Katrina mentioned Notting Hill, but another example is why do we police Reading Festival much more differently than Royal Ascot. And they are absolutely evident examples. Um, and police ultimately have a duty to keep people safe. And we can do this, in which we are doing this proudly now within TVP uh, and, and our violence reduction unit with our partnerships, is, is through drug diversion and education and harm reduction. Because police actually, although we can implement some of the unintended consequences of harm, disproportionality and inequality. We are now beginning to realise that in a trauma informed way and 
um, and lead a health based uh, approach to drug possession. So no longer do we need to arrest anyone, interview anyone or even a required admission of guilt from a young person using the community resolution. And the community resolution is, an, is a golden gem of legislation that, that negates the need for those harmful measures. And we can merely through a trauma informed way invite someone into a drugs education uh, program or have an assessment, non judgmental assessment on that day or the day after by a drugs expert. The police can go away in 10 minutes and that's the end. But most importantly, it doesn't doesn't um, leave a criminal footprint on someone's record, for instance. So we don't damage future opportunities. We can do that now within the current legal framework. So then you might ask, why aren't all forces doing this? And we are working hard to share that work and West Mids are here and we've worked together on uh, diversion schemes. Um, but it's it, this should be, you know, throughout the, um, throughout the UK, but there's not the evidence base uh, for some uh, forces to take that on yet. So we're working with the NIHR um, bid uh, led by Professor Alex Stevens, which is a multi-force MPCC, College of Policing, MOJ, Home Office uh, 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 enterprise, if you like, to evaluate uh, quality drug diversion. But drug diversion is about partnerships. It's about communities, partnerships, and drugs experts leading the intervention, not police. So this is a health-based intervention. So we can only achieve drug reform really through a whole system public health approach, which involves communities, part, cross-sex partnerships, as I've mentioned, but most importantly, with lived experience at the heart of all policy making. Lived experience needs to be on rough sleeper programmes. Lived experience must be uh, needed within our own drug strategies internally uh, and within our wider partnerships. We must and absolutely must reduce drug related deaths. A single drug related death is one too many. We must, we must reduce drug related deaths through evidence based interventions, such as drug diversion, if you like, for a generational change um, for, through quality education, but also through the more politically, the politically prickly subjects of supervised injection facilities. These are evidence based, yet they're avoided within the UK context and conversation because of the politics around them. Any health based intervention should not be politicised. If the evidence is there, it works then we need to be trusted and trust our partnerships to enable that within our own communities here. Naloxone, as you can see behind me, there's a national naloxone campaign and I've stolen with pride uh, a, a, a billboard. Uh, I hope they don't mind. But there's some comments on there that are absolutely deafening in, in relevancy because um, there's a, a young lady behind me, I think, to uh, my what shoulder is that? My right shoulder, uh, with uh, that says who says I didn't know what naloxone was until it saved my life. How powerful is that comment? And that's because stigma prevents naloxone, if you like, from getting into the communities. It prevents people who are vulnerable and marginalised from knowing about these life-saving interventions. The work of our peer support groups is absolutely outstanding. We need to. Um, support that within our policy making. We can't do that without the help and voice of lived experience. Um, we absolutely support investment into recovery and treatment. We must invest heavily into the causes of the causes. Now, the violence reduction units are pioneering, innovative, but partnership led. Although there's a policing uh, image around them, actually, they are partnerships. They're nothing really to do with police but they have police involvement within that strategic leadership i guess but they are they are governed by the whole community they're a community asset now uh, the vius are really useful to connect the dots dame carol mentioned there about the prison to community transition and harmonizing uh, treatment pathways for the most um vulnerable to uh, relapse and to enable recovery so therefore if uh, a, a a prisoner release um, was uh, given buvidal for instance in the prison establishment which uh, which um, suppresses uh, craving then it's no good if that if the intended if his or her intended destination doesn't have that within their menu of treatment options in fact you're setting that that person up to up to fail way before that now, those dots aren't quite joined, but the VIU is a testament to that. And we can we, we are proud to work with the NHS Reconnect programme uh, 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 within our Thames Valley region and wider afield to, to try and close those dots with all of our 
public health commissioners and drug treatment services. But the commissioners and the wider partnership is absolutely key. Um, if we don't treat the causes of the causes and don't invest heavily where we need it the most within treatment sector, we're just plugging holes with sand. If we don't address the cause, we won't address the harms. Now, Danny Ahmed of Middlesbrough mentioned the role of heroin assisted treatment. Now, injectable opioid treatment works. Professor Sir John Strang evidenced that it's significant outcomes. Now, I'm going to look at this just from a policing lens, and um, it's, it's absolutely true that uh, acquisitive crime, if you like, by the uh, top 10%. Now, I'm going to avoid as much as possible some stigmatizing language here, but I want to try and get it across to you as, as, as eloquently as poss possible, that the most heaviest using group will um, need to uh, need to steal to fund the most uh, of, of their of their um, of, of their uh, heroin. So if, if we are able to uh, re-engage the most disengaged in our communities, we can eliminate, as Professor Sir John Strang has, and also the Cleveland PAT model has uh, acquisitive crime down uh, by 78% in the in the riot trial model, but also uh, within Middlesbrough, uh, I believe it was 800. Uh, and 18 crimes uh, within three months dropped to 10 crimes just with a cohort of 12 people. If that doesn't benefit the whole community, I don't know what else will. And also, not only forgetting the, 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 the um, acquisitive crime reductions through, through a policing lens, you, you're also eliminating a significant chunk of the organised crime behind that and the exploitation and the harms to the community. So therefore, heroin assisted treatment or a regulated model for heroin uh, in a similar way, uh, and I'm not an expert here to go into detail on that, but there are there are some experts in obviously within the UK um, can transform can absolutely transform what the heroin market looks like within the UK. And unless we do tackle um, uh, issues such as heroin assisted treatment and fund them properly, we're just going to be peddling water again. We're just going to be going around in circles and circles, and as Katrina said, be back here in 50 years' time. We haven't got time for that. Too many people are dying. There is nothing soft about preventing death. We cannot arrest our way through this and enforce recovery. We need to change that narrative today and we need to support and not punish. And we need to put right the inequalities, the marginalization and the stigmatization that drug policy has caused so far. Um, I'm going to shut up there because I could probably go on all day and the road noise is probably deafening. But um, thank you very much for, for, for having me and I'm um, happy to take any, any other questions. Sorry, there's always that awkward pause where I'm trying to like unmute myself and then I can't. Um, but thank you uh, for highlighting some of the work that you're doing, Jason, and diverting people away from our criminal justice system and yeah, getting them into harm reduction. And yeah, as you say, and I think it was echoed by uh, Dame Carroll around like strong leadership and um, yeah, the importance of partnership. So thank you. Um, moving on to our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Jane Nichols, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Transform Drugs Foundation, Drug Policy Foundation, and an honorary associate professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, James has uh, worked on substance use issues for over 20 years and was previously Director of Research at Alcohol Change UK and a member of the Public Health England Alcohol Leadership Board. So, James? Thank you, uh, yes, to um, the CJA for, for setting up this, this meeting um, and, to, and to all the speakers uh, so far. Uh, it's been it's been great. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, as Mal said, I'm uh, uh, Chief Executive of Transform Drug Policy Foundation. We're a, a, an independent charity that campaigns for reform of drug policy to promote social justice, human rights and public health. Uh, Transform also runs the Anyone's Child campaign, which provides a voice for families who've been directly impacted by uh, drug related harms and who want to advocate for changes to current policy. And so uh, this year we've been engaged working with partners 
uh, including release, drug science and others uh, uh, in a campaign which is marking the 50th anniversary of the Misuse of Drugs Act. And uh, on that anniversary, we're calling for a root and branch review of the legislative framework for UK drug policy and UK drug strategy. Um, Dame Carroll, uh, as she mentioned, published last year a, a really fantastic and comprehensive review of drug markets. Um, and uh, as you've heard, her report on treatment systems will be coming out soon. But what we've not had, and as uh, Dame Carroll mentioned, was not within the remit of, of her work, is a similar thorough systematic review of the primary legislation and the possible alternatives to our current overarching system. Uh, and that is what we're calling for uh, with, this, with this campaign. Um, the Misuse of Drugs Act was introduced at a time when things were very different socially, economically, culturally. Now, age alone isn't sufficient to, uh, uh, to call for legislative review, review, not by itself, but in the case of drug policy, it is really significant. We know that uh, drug markets, cultures of consumption, policing, supply, uh, production, have all changed significantly, been transformed really since 1971. We know much more about drug risks and effects than we did then, and we've got many more models for drug policy alternatives um, than was the case when the law was created. So on that basis alone, there's justification, in fact, an urgent need for a review of, of, of the Act. But also, and perhaps more importantly, we know that the Act is not delivering on what it was designed to achieve. Um, it hasn't prevented dramatic increases in consumption across all drug types and among all age groups. If you look at heroin use uh, levels uh, in 1971, which were well below uh, 10,000 uh, people uh, using heroin in the country, um, it's around a quarter of a million now. Uh, cannabis use uh, is, is many, many times higher than it was when the law was introduced. And drug-related deaths, which were, you know, in the in the hundreds um, uh, back in the early 70s, are now uh, closer to, to uh, 5,000 uh, around the whole of the UK. So um, it's not achieving those outcomes. It also creates huge costs within the criminal justice system. You've heard uh, about some of that already. Uh, since 1971, there have been 1.8 million convictions under the Misuse of Drugs Act um, and 3 million criminal records, if you include uh, cautions as well. That's a, that's a huge number of people fed into the uh, criminal justice system. Um, around 16% of the current prison population uh, is, is there uh, for drug, drug offences. And again, according to Dan Cowell's previous review, if we include all drug related offences, um, that goes up to something closer to a third. Uh, policing and criminal justice costs uh, around 1.5 billion annually, um, and we've and we've heard from uh, Katrina about the, the the extent to which the Misuse of Drugs Act, especially stop and search powers, are applied disproportionately, and contribute directly uh, uh, to over policing, the breakdown of policing community relations, and on a very personal level, because I think the lived experience of people who experience um, that kind of over policing is 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 vital to recognise. Uh, uh, how, how uh, the degree of suffering that causes at an individual level as well. Um, UK drug related deaths are now five times the European average. Uh, and if we look at Scotland alone, if we separate Scotland out, they're, they're amongst the highest in the world. So we, 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 on no grounds can we, can we say that uh, uh, the, the system we have in place is, is, is successful. Now, of course, you could argue that's evidence that the treatment system isn't working, um, but uh, I, while Dame Carroll's report will address issues in treatment and while we know treatment needs to be better funded, it's been decimated in terms of funding uh, in recent years. That's just it. That is not the whole picture. It's an absolutely vital part of the picture. And it's great that, they, that this report is going to be coming out, but it's obviously not the whole picture. The legal framework, the blanket prohibition of drugs, the criminal justice led approach, the police led approach, the focus on enforcement above public health, uh, exacerbates and amplifies the risks and dangers inherent in drugs and creates a whole raft of additional harms. Um, not least uh, the, the, you know, the, the impact on the life chances of people by being criminalized, by going to prison you know, uh, uh, for use or supply of drugs. Um, not least the fact that we have huge global organized crime groups controlling markets um, and the impact of that on violence and exploitation right throughout the supply chain, um, or having inflexible laws that prevent innovations like overdose pre prevention centers. You know, all of these are contributing to and, and uh, exacerbating harms, not reducing them. 
Uh, you could, of course, argue, and some people still do, that enforcement just hasn't been strict enough, but we've got no evidence that that's the case. And, and, and we do have plenty of evidence that when you take the logic of escalating the drug war or escalating drug uh, uh, enforcement to its, to its uh, conclusion, you end up with some of the most appalling abuses of human rights. The uh, uh, International Criminal Court calling for an investigation to the Philippines last week was an example of that. There you have a dehumanizing uh, attack on poor people, uh, which is justified entirely on the grounds of the, the war on drugs. Now, in the UK context, that's different, but the government rhetoric remains all about cutting heads off snakes and cracking down on drug gangs and, you know, uh, a, a, an absolute enforcement led focus, but there's no evidence that more enforcement achieves its goals in the long run. Uh, and if Dave Carroll will forgive me, I'm going to quote from, <laughs> from uh, phase one of, 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 of her report on, on this issue. It said, the, this is a quote, the available evidence is complex, but su uh, suggests that enforcement crackdowns have little impact on the overall drug supply. Some enforcement can have short-term benefits in reducing harm, but these are often short-lived given the resilience and flexibility of organized crime groups. Enforcement can often have the unintended consequences of increasing violence, for example, by creating a gap in the market for dealers to compete over or increasing distrust in the drugs market. And many people with a policing background uh, will recognize uh, that reality that uh, 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 disruptions in, in supply uh, will lead to increased violence as that gap in the in the market opens up and other other groups uh, compete to fill it. Um, now, none of this is to say that either decriminalisation or the establishment of licensed forms of supply are a silver bullet. Uh, you know that we could re resolve all those problems and resolve all drug deaths and resolve all, all drug-related violence by by uh, 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 taking a different approach to the law. But it is to say that we urgently need to have a national conversation about where we are now, about how our primary legislation has uh, contributed to that and how and what we can do uh, 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 by way of an alternative. Because we're not trapped within the status quo. Um, Decriminalisation is in place in around 30 countries across the world. It's done differently in different countries, some places much better than others, but it's, 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 it's in place. Um, the United Nations uh, in 2019, a report from a body representing all 31 UN agencies uh, explicitly supported decriminalization. This is, this is something that has got support uh, at, at, at all levels. Um, in Portugal, which is probably the most famous example of, of decriminalization, certainly in Europe, you know, the, the, what they did there was they uh, 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 introduced a, a, a decriminalization, but at the same time took a, a clearly health-led approach to drug to, to, to drug issues so that so you know the, the focus moved away from criminalization and towards support and towards help and towards health um, and uh, transform recently uh, uh, published a revised uh, report on the the the, the um, outcomes of that of that change in the last 20 years which are many and complex but the uh, on the headline measures of drug related deaths which were at and around the EU average, when decriminalization was introduced, they're now half the EU average, um, reductions in, in um, and the numbers of proportion of people in prison for drug related offenses. On most measures, it's been a success. Um, at, at the same time, also, as has been mentioned, legal regulation of, of currently uh, illegal drugs is happening around the world, uh, particularly around, or specifically around cannabis. Uh, cannabis for adult non-medical use is now in place in 15, uh, states in, in the US, it's in Canada, in Uruguay, many other countries are looking to shift towards legal supply, including Switzerland. Um, and one of the advantages of that uh, is that we're learning a huge amount very quickly about how to get this right and also how to get this wrong. And there is a huge amount of learning that needs to be synthesized and needs to be uh, considered. And also it shows that the that, that, that change is possible and is happening around the world. So given where we are, our view is, is that we need urgently to address the extraordinary political taboo on discussing drug policy in the UK. We know, we all know the stories of politicians who talk about, you know, oh, well, well, I took drugs and I was at university, Keir Starmer being the most recent of that, uh, in effect. Um, but now, uh, fall back to the position of, of well, the status quo, it, it's, it's roughly right, it's, it's fine, we need to stick with it, best of, 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 of the options that we have. This kind of re refusal to look directly at the problem and to say, what can we do differently? We also all know the kind of number of ex-politicians who, as soon as they leave office, 
admit or acknowledge the failures of drug policy or who are openly in favour of reform until they go into office and then they go quiet again. Um, that taboo, I think, it needs to be broken. Uh, and the focus uh, or the point for us and many of our partners at the moment is to make it clear that continuing to push the issue of the legal framework to one side can't be acceptable any longer. It needs to be clear that not challenging or interrogating the status quo or saying it's just too difficult or saying, well, it's roughly, it's, it's okay, you know, it's what we have, is not a neutral position. It's actually supporting what we have and it's actively supporting the outcomes that that has produced. Now, of course, the alternatives to what we have now are varied. Transform has its own view on what the long-term policy goal should be. We support the legal regulation. Uh, uh, works can't be done differently and that means getting as many sectors organizations individuals politicians uh, public figures as possible engaged in the debate I don't know if I just broke up then I've got a note saying my internet is sitting stable so apologies if that's the case uh, and for the debate about the alternatives to be open um, we've made quite a strong start on that on the parliamentary front over 50 MPs have now signed a statement calling for a review of the act We've got a, there's a, a debate in Parliament tomorrow on this issue. Um, and we'd really encourage any organisations uh, who want to see this debate happen and to continue and to grow, to get in touch or just to speak out about their experiences and perspectives, to put it onto the table to discuss how drug policy affects their work, the people they're uh, 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 concerned with and the people they work with. As I say, if we can't take a serious look at the legal framework and its alternatives now, 50 years in, and after the comprehensive reviews of the market and treatment that have been carried out by Dane Carroll, when can we? And that's the question that we're posing. So thank you to the CJ again for facilitating this discussion. Um, I think it's going to be really important to hear the views of CJM members, um, whichever way they land in terms, of, in terms of their views on what works and what doesn't work. Um, so hopefully this is the start of a, of a much longer conversation. Thank you. Thanks, James, and thanks for laying out sort of the mounting evidence that tells us that our current approach isn't working and that we do, um, as you say, um, need leadership that doesn't accept the status quo as a feasible or practical approach. Um, OK, so moving on to our final speaker. Sorry. Um, so our last speaker is Sunny Dudley, who is a strategic advisor and consultant. Uh, Sunny is a leader with lived experience of addiction as well as other social harms. In 2007, he began uh, developing holistic peer-led programs to support those affected by addiction and has challenged policy approaches and systemic barriers ever since. Sunny is currently a senior lived experience uh, advisor to the NH. SEI Health and Justice Directorate, as well as a consultant in quality, di diversity and inclusion, as well as co-production best practice. So, Sunny, over to you. Thank, thank you, um, Amal, and thank you to, to CJA. Uh, it's lovely to see you again, Dame Carol Black, and uh, as well as other friends and colleagues are on the call. I'm going to do something different and try and share my screen. And please, if someone can tell me if they are seeing it. Yep, yeah, fantastic. Okay, so I've got to keep this pretty um, quick as well because I also have a school run at around about 10 past three, but hopefully we'll be done by then. So um, the Misuse of Drugs Act, 50 years on. I chose this background picture because it demonstrates um, a complex kind of uh, economical system. Uh, and the first thing, you know, that I want to say is that, you know, the, the Misuse of drug, Drugs Act, 50 years on, the, the drug, illicit drug marketplace is becoming even more complex. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if nothing's done in a, another 50 years that, you know, there'll be more kind of sophisticated ways in which that marketplace operates. So I just want to take you back to um, the early hours of um, Wednesday, the 26th of July, 2006. Uh, the location is Wolverhampton Ring Road. Um, and this was not the first or not the last time that I, I'd interacted with the police. Um, I was pulled over uh, and the reason they stated for the stop was speeding. Um, I had concealed on me a, a 16th of heroin with a street value of around about 50 pounds. Um, 
and you know a, a possible or likely penalty would have been seven years imprisonment. Now, the reason that I purchased um, these drugs um, were for personal use. Uh, the reason I purchased them at this time is because at, at that time in my life, I was claiming job seekers allowance. My money became available to me one minute after midnight, at which point then obviously I went off and you know, um, needed to get what, what I needed to get. Now, on this occasion, the disposal was that I was released without charge, although I, I was in the back of that car for quite some time. Uh, and my immediate thought was to get home to alleviate my, my, um, my withdrawal symptoms. Um, and then, you know, my subsequent thought thereafter was, you know, this time I was lucky because, you know, this was not an uncommon thing to happen to me or to people um, who I was interacting with. Now, shortly after this period of time, and what I what I will say is that the fear of um, you know criminal sanctions didn't really they they weren't the driver for me to want to change. The driver was that my life was a mess uh, and that I, I wanted to achieve things with my life and with my level of drug use that would have been very difficult to do. So I commenced a community detoxification on the tenth of September in two thousand and seven, uh, and at, at that point um, I just want to mention treat, treatment responsiveness because I entered treatment for the umpteenth time and I'd said what treatments I wanted and it wasn't necessarily given to me in the time that I, at the time that I needed it without me having to fight. You know, nobody should have to fight to get the treatment that they, that they need or, or deserve. Um, the first job, job opportunity that came my way after detoxing was as, as a drug runner. I gracefully declined, having seen firsthand all of the heartache that it caused myself, my family and people around me. Um, so I decided to start volunteering, uh, and this was completely self-directed. There was no personal organisation saying, why don't you do a bit of this or a bit of that? The, um, the environment around me didn't really encourage um, people like me to, to, to go on and achieve certain things, but I did. Uh, I began volunteering and subsequently gained a leadership role uh, with suit the name of the organisation in August 2008. Um, I'm, I'm really, you know, happy and pleased to say that I went on uh, to work alongside ten, tens of thousands of people, um, but very in the very early days began noticing strategic, systemic and policy failings that were affecting people on a daily, daily basis. And I think this, you know, hopefully with Dame, Dame Carol Black's um, part two of the review will bring about the type of changes we needed um, and we still need uh, because to this day these, these failings still exist. So, you know, I decided to do something about it rather than waiting for the systems to change. And I began noticing that hearts and minds began to be transformed at a local level, um, both within law enforcement, within statutory services, within individual community members themselves. Um, I decided to leave suit uh, to become a freelance, freelance consultant, uh, advisor and speaker in January of 2019. Uh, and then at the start of this year, 15, year, 15 years or so, um, after, after the incidents I just described, I've been um, appointed as a senior lived experience advisor to NHSC and I, to the senior management team. So some of my reflections, you know, in terms of, you know, my lived and learned experience and what history has taught us is that the act, as we've heard already, is steeped in injustice and disproportionality. You know, that the, the evidence exists, the data exists. Uh, and it, it, I don't think it's too out there to say that, that, that it is unjust and disproportionate. In terms of you know, keeping society safe, what's happened, drug availability, quality and harms have increased exponentially, you know, not just by a small amount, but, you know, but by a large amount. I would, I would then go on to say that criminalizing people who use drugs diverts attention away from meeting their socioeconomic and health needs. I would all, all, almost say that it's, a, it's an easy way out rather than having to you know, work closely with community members to help them um, you know, with the needs that they may have. Within that, there, as it's again has been mentioned, there are deep-rooted societal factors that impact large sections of our society. Part of that is due to um, race, ethnicity, but as, as Katrina mentioned, also to do with class. Um, if I, you know, when I look back, the vast majority of people I come into contact with were from a, um, the, the lower social classes, should I say, people who are reliant upon the welfare system, people who lived in substandard accommodation, yet the system around us was not responding in a coordinated way to meet their needs. So I was able to, to address some of that within, within um, project delivery. 
Again, as we've heard, and as Dan Carroll said, the system is fragmented, overly complex and bureaucratic. There's a, a focus on outputs rather than outcomes, and I think this drastically needs to change. I would also add that I, I, I firmly believe that many of the assets that we need to achieve improved outcomes exist. Yet the key thing that, that's missing is coordination and who takes ownership of ensuring that you know, community needs are met in a coordinated fashion. And another element that I feel is, 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 is important and should be looked at, and I'm glad that Dame Carroll mentioned um, kind of value for money, but social value uh, and, and social benefits, I believe through the act is minimal. You know, it might serve to appease certain sections of society, whereas we've got swathes of people who are, are suffering um, unnecessarily. And, you know, one thing I, I, I will also say is that I'm no different to anybody else. I'm no different to that active drug user today or the person that's um, sat outside the train station, if it's open, I haven't been for so long, um, you know, trying to make money to meet, to meet their individual needs, but that we all have talents waiting to be unearthed. However, I feel that the Act is permit, not permitting the majority to do that for the reasons that we've heard so far. In terms of recommendations, let's, let's use the evidence to influence hearts and minds, absolutely integrating lived experience and living experience within that. Uh, if we are serious about it, let's adopt, let's adopt decrim decriminalization immediately to halt the harm to individuals. Every second that we waste, the more people, the more harm that is taking place. Um, as James mentioned also, the, you know, let's, it's time to have a grown up discussion about the benefits of a legal framework. Um, and, you know, the, the, you know, especially in a time like this, going through all of the challenges we're facing as an econ uh, economy, as a society, as, as, a, as a global community, you know, the, you know, the, the, the Treasury could really benefit from something like a regulated um, 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 framework around drugs and how that could be used for lots of positive ways. Um, J um, Jason mentioned it a few times and he always mentions it and, and I love him for doing so, but I feel that we need to deliver some sort of anti-stigma campaign to counteract all of this current and historical shame and discrimination that's taken place. Even if it doesn't, you know, wholesale change people's thoughts, at least it's a demonstration that you know we're we're aware of some of the stigma and how it's come about and what we need to do to try and change it. Uh, another aspect is around improving equality of opportunity, um, and that's across the system, whether it's in the CJS, whether it's um, in in uh, the Department for Work and Pensions. I mean, it doesn't matter where it is. We should be doing everything we can do to improve opportunity access to everybody, particularly those who are marginalised, uh, criminalised, uh, and vulnerable. Um, in terms of the treatment system, the mental health and substance misuse, um, and hopefully this will happen, um, requires significant investment uh, in order to, to meet the needs. Um, in terms of the kind of root causes, uh, there are so many inequalities that exist around us, race, health, education, finance. These are the things that are driving some of the poor outcomes and poor life experiences that needed addressing. In terms of the systems, I mentioned that you know, the, 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 generally the, the, the assets exist. However, we need to reconfigure systems to deliver a much wider range of our outcomes and look at how we build human capital into the work that's taking place. Um, and I'll just finish by saying that, you know, it's an we have an opportunity in time to reimagine what justice means in 2021 and beyond. Thank you. Thanks for that presentation, Sunny, really succinct. And again, uh, reinforcing the power that is lived experience. So thank you. Um, so we have between five to 10 minutes to take questions. Um, if you put your questions in the chat and then we'll get Jamie to unmute. So um, somebody has said they'd like to hear if uh, Dame Carol has any sort of uh, comments at this point. Oh, no. Sorry, we're just trying to get you unmuted. <laughs> Jamie? Carol, I think you might have to unmute yourself.
the, host, the host can do it in the um you you just get the list of speakers up and that you can switch the mutes on and off <clears throat> no okay well whilst we're waiting for jamie to do that i have um a question so at the cjo we've been doing a specific piece of work on improving race diversity in the criminal justice sector and I wondered whether um, any of the panelists see race diversity or representation as an issue in drug policy or drug treatment settings. So I know Dame Carroll has spoken about lived experience I just wondered if anybody had considered. Amal? Any? Yeah. Yeah so um yeah Professionally, I think I walk into rooms and I'm quite used to, from my Cambridge education to walk into a room and not see much brown. Um, so that's fine. But then in my professional life, I, I do see it replicated. And I think that comes from, though, um, stigma sometimes from even pursuing certain things is potential interest because we've been so told not to go into those things, even professionally, but also from community lived experience. Um, I'm so pleasure to hear Sunny, Sunny speak. There's still that stigma about putting your head above the parapet. And that is even if you smoke just a bit of weed, let alone if you're doing other things or have done, you know, harder drugs that have had more social harm. So we need to have more representation. And I think the rest representation will have the diversity of thought and also across all spectrum of drug use. Um, I have, should have mentioned that black people, brown people are no more likely to use drugs than their white counterparts, but much more likely to be stopped and search arrested. And it, what's crazy about that is you're stopping them at maybe nine times the rate and still finding just what you find on <laughs> lesser white people. So the numbers still don't stack up there. And I think it's saddening that we're stopped and searched, but they're not represented in the policy arenas or even some of these commerce or rehabilitation settings, which is essential for us to get the right services. So yeah, we, we need to we need to change that. Thanks, Katrina. Uh, did any of the other panelists want to come back? Yeah, hi, hi Mel. Um, it's, it's a really good point, actually. I'd be really interested to see the research uh, ongoing at the moment with West Midlands, uh, I understand with their diversion scheme, um, that will be uh, really informative about uh, disproportionality and uh, the role of diversion within that. Uh, I think um, one of the, the kind of alarm bells really, or warning shots, if you like, around diversion would be, it's still policing drugs, isn't it? You know, it's still a police intervention. And I think the best that we can try to put forward at the moment is is that we limit that in that interaction uh, as to as short a time as possible to enable a health-based intervention what we are seeing is not perfect but what we are seeing is a better relationship and that's absolutely crucial because now there isn't a punitive conversation it's now more about trying to you know encourage someone to engage to get an assessment about what they've been found with or what they're using but also quality education, harm reduction, et cetera. There's just two points before I finish on this. Um, the first is that over half of the people diverted into the drug uh, substance misuse provider um, uh, choose to stay on beyond the end of the, the course, um, which is really, this is testament, which is um, fascinating because it's the range of options within the yacht. Now, I don't like the yacht, that's another conversation for another day. This, uh, obviously the offending aspects of that needs to be dropped, but the super youth club kind of analogy of in, a range of interventions available uh, and, and, and offers for young people is 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 is, is incredible um, the only thing around uh, diversion will be um, the inevitable unintended potential increase in stops that's that is something we need to be really careful about because you know police officers will have an easy outcome at their disposal uh, but you know the danger of that is is over policing of course and we need to really consider that that's great. Uh, Sunny? Uh, just to add to that, I think I've, I've been around particularly the, the drug and alcohol system for so long now that, you know, I can say with, with some confidence that e um, equality, diversity and inclusion is something that needs to be addressed. I think um, if, if we look at, you know, when Dame Carroll mentioned leadership, you know, one thing that I would be calling for, as I'm sure you can imagine, is lived experience leadership. Uh, whereas I think, you know, as a system and systems, we've become, a, become accustomed to employing people perhaps at a kind of peer support level uh, and kind of that's, you know, the beginning and end of, uh, of, their, of their 
career, as it were. Yeah, but I'd be calling for much more around kind of uh, inclusivity in, uh, within the workforce and looking at workforce development, and not just within the drug and alcohol sector, but within the criminal justice system, within politics, within business, within all, all sectors and areas. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely work to be done. Thanks, Sunny. And James, did you have your hand up? I did. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I, I kind of to echo what everyone else said. I think there's undeniably a, 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 an issue around diversity within um, the drug policy uh, arena in, in, in the UK uh, in particular. Um, and we're conscious of that to transform uh, ourselves, of course. Um, and there's different ways, I think, to uh, address that, one of which is through partnership work, I think one of the jobs of drug policy organisations is just generally speaking, actually, to try and reach, uh, reach out and work with partners who are representing uh, 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 different communities and different experiences, whether that's directly to do with drugs or not, actually. Um, so, uh, and I mean, it's, so it's one of the things when we were quite lucky to get some funding from Trust for London recently to partner with an organisation called Black Sox to try and see if we can develop ways in which the, the those voices which are so often not heard for the reasons I think that Katrina mentioned as well around stigma around around the kind of challenges of speaking out it's a lot easier to be frankly honest for you know some of these white and middle class to speak out quite often on drug issues because the risks are just lower and, and I think you know the stigma is lower and all of that and we'd have to be totally honest about that privilege which is what it is um, to see if, you know how we can work in partnership with organizations to try and create spaces in which uh, those other voices can be heard in which we can listen to those other voices in which they can inform the debate and in which they can then be brought forward and amplified within the debate. Um, I think it's, it's vital work that needs doing and hopefully going some way to, to improving that, but there's a huge amount more to be done, I think. Thanks, James. Um, Jamie, are we able to unmute Dame Carroll? So, yeah, she just sent me an email to say that she's um, left the meeting because she couldn't figure out how to do it and she pressed the wrong okay. button. But what, what I will do is ask her to provide a comment um, that I can send around to everyone who registered for the event today. That's that's really helpful. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I guess that brings us to the end of our panel discussion. So I will thank you to all the speakers and I'll hand back to Kevin. Thanks very much, Amal, and thanks to, to all, the, all the panel members. Uh, Really appreciate you uh, taking the time to attend today and contribute to a, a really insightful and uh, very helpful discussion. So uh, I've got great pleasure in uh, handing over to, to Nina, uh, our director of the CJA, uh, to give you a very, very short pricey on CJA, but very important pricey on uh, CJA news. Uh, so over to you, Nina. Thank you, Kevin. Oh, yeah, how do I beat that panel? Well, yeah, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much to all our panellists and to Transform for um, for the idea for, for the uh, um, subject for this uh, meeting today. Um, and I know that we opened up our um, event today to non-members as well, so it would be wrong of me not to do a quick plug that um, if anyone who works for organisations who's interested in joining the, the Criminal Justice Alliance to uh, take a look at our, our new website uh, that Jamie's worked hard on, um, we've got information about um, our other events and and bulletins and things that you would get if uh, you want to join CJ as a member. Um, as I said, this is an area that actually that you know criminal justice science haven't done a lot of work on in the past, um, and we hope that this you know um, initial event will help us to sort of kick off this discussion, um, and it's give, certainly given us lots of food uh, for thought about how we might um, continue to support some of this work of our members working in this space um, in the future as we develop our our strategy, our next strategy, which begins next year. Um, so first, I just wanted to say a few quick things about uh, some of our key areas of work. Um, one that's just been touched on. So we actually have three kind of cross-cutting strands of systemic change work. And Amal just mentioned one of them, which is around a fit for purpose and diverse workforce, looking both at lived experience um, and race equality in particular. Um, and as a result of our change from within report, um, talking, you know, reflecting on what Sunny was just saying about lived experience leadership, um, our lived experience expert group and um, our paid uh, interns through the Longford Trust have been working really hard over the past two years 
uh, developing the Change from Within report about lived experience, um, recruitment, retention and progression in the criminal justice and social justice sector, and also in developing um, a lived experience leadership programme. Um, and we must have been successful in the same funding round, James, because we've just secured half the funding that we need for a lived experience programme, which has completely been uh, co-produced and developed by people with lived experience, the criminal justice system, um, for a kind of a leadership programme to work with uh, lived experience leaders who are currently working in kind of frontline peer roles to support them to progress into sort of more senior roles, influencing roles, research roles. Um, so we've secured half that funding. So we'll continue to be seeking now the, the remainder of that funding. So uh, fingers crossed um, we can we can report some positive uh, further news on that. Um, Anna Moles also been working hard on our work on race diversity across the criminal justice system, as she mentioned, um, with a report on that uh, coming out later this year. Um, another one of our work streams is around effective scrutiny and accountability and some of you will be aware that um, earlier in May we launched a super complaint, we're a designated super complainant body um, around policing and we launched a super complaint um, calling for the repeal of section 60 stop and searches which is um, uh, our suspicionless searches um, which are particularly ineffective and disproportionate in their use and also calling for a national oversight body to improve community scrutiny of all stop and searches. Um, so we actually had our first sort of subsequent meeting with uh, the HMIC and the Independent um, Office of Police Conduct uh, this morning as they um, look at our start to look at our um, submission to them. Um, and Amal's also been working hard with the Independent Monitoring Boards and the Independent Custody Visitors Association, looking at how they monitor, in particularly race and gender equality issues in police and prison custody. So again, more on that uh, later this year. Um, and our third cross-cutting strand is promoting a restorative criminal justice system. So some of you may have been at an event we held in partnership with the British Journal of Community Justice uh, in May, which was very successful. And we're um, helping to pursue that, uh, what would a more restorative criminal justice system look like? Um, and in more recent news, we've uh, been invited and accepted uh, to be on the advisory board of a new all-party parliamentary group on restorative justice, uh, which will be looking again at ways of increasing access to restorative justice and restorative practices uh, across the criminal justice system and also in other settings uh, such as, as schools and, and health as well. So, uh, so yeah, we're excited to be working on that. Um, other things that we've been working on, um, many of you will have uh, will know about the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill. Um, obviously, lots of attention on the protest aspect of it, but we've been focusing on the race inequality aspect of that bill, um, particularly on the sentencing and policing provisions. Um, and have given evidence to the Public Bill Committee, uh, written an open letter to the Prime Minister. I've got a petition, if you haven't seen it, I'm sure Jamie will, will post a link to that. Um, Amal's also been working with police and crime commissioners. We published a briefing called Public Safety, Public Trust. Uh, we've obviously just had the new election, so we want to be working with newly elected PCCs to promote good practice. We've got examples in that briefing of diversion of, of some of the programmes like naloxone and the heroin assisted treatment that were discussed today. Um, and we've got an, an event coming up for PC, Office of PCCs and others about how they co-produce their police and crime plans uh, with a particular focus on building trust and tackling race inequality. Um, and finally, a new project that we've, we're have we delighted to have started with funding from Porticus is focusing on positive pathways from prison, in particular with a focus on employment and families and relationships. So more on that uh, to come as well. Um, we welcomed four new members, uh, Unjust, so thank you Katrina for uh, coming to speak as a new member, uh, Landworks, Inside Justice and Network for Justice. Um, and we've also been very delighted to um, welcome a new member of staff, Annette So, who's on the call, who's our first deputy director um, at the Criminal Justice Alliance. Um, so, um, and it may well be, um, not sure when our next members meeting is, uh, probably at the start and the start of the autumn. Um, and so, I'm unfortunately had to share the news that our policy officer, Amal Ali, uh, this will probably be her last uh, members meeting. Um, she is off to 
uh, start a PhD. So we're very proud of her for securing um, a scholarship to do a PhD in uh, disproportionality in policing. So on, on the lines of these topics, um, an area that she's uh, sort of a lot of expertise in. So yeah, we really congratulate her and thank her for all her um, hard work on, on many of our areas of work, like the super complaint and, and the race equality work that we've been doing in particular. Um, that goes on behind the scenes. So really want to thank her. And we are recruiting a, a senior policy officer. Um, if anyone um, knows of anyone who, who might be interested, do uh, please share that uh, opportunity. Um, we've, we're going to be sharing on Friday the results of our um, member survey that over half of our members completed recently as part of our external evaluation. Um, and we're going to be working with members and providing opportunities over the summer to help develop our new strategy, as I mentioned, uh, which would start in April next year. So looking at which themes and areas we want to explore over the next three years. So if you're interested, please do get in contact. Um, or to say thank you very much again for, uh, for all the contributions today. Really enjoyed hearing from them, from you all. Um, and thank you very much. And I'll just pass back to Kevin. That's great. Thanks so much, uh, Nina. And thanks for a very quick uh, run through uh, all the various things that the CJA uh, are currently involved in. Just one last sort of notice to mention, actually, um, and, and I think it probably slipped me his mind because we only had talked about it yesterday, but we are thinking of uh, recruiting uh, some additional trustees to the board. So do look out for information about that, which will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, so all that remains for me to say is to thank uh, all our contributors, uh, both our speakers and all the, the audience, all the people who've attended. Uh, thanks for all the comments and the questions you put in the chat. Uh, it, it's great to sort of see this involvement and this engagement and this interest. And uh, just to say, um, well, hope you enjoy the rest of your day, uh, but also we'll see you uh, at the next members meeting, which will be the other side of summer. So do enjoy the rest of summer. Uh, hope you have a good holiday, uh, wherever you're gonna be, uh, and uh, we'll see you all soon. Uh, so thanks again for attending and uh, take care.